sweet presence of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Why don't you turn to your neighbor? And we can turn the lights on so we can see our neighbors. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus loves you. And then tell your neighbor, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. That's right, V-Man, yes. It's a simple truth, right? Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. It's a very, very simple truth, but it's very, very profound. It's one of the main things that if we can just get that and live out of that every day, man, our lives are just going to be changed, turned around, amazing. Oh, you guys are still here. You guys can go if you like. <laughs> Turn around. Here they are still. Thank you, guys. Sorry? You want to accompany me? Okay, all right. If that's, what, if that's what you want to do. Jesus loves you, and you can do that if you want. That's fine. Those guys are awesome. Yes, Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. He's, he, he's, he's amazing. He's just the fact that he would love us so much the way that he does. It's, you know, the Bible says this is love. Not that we loved him, but that he first loved us. That he first loved us. And, and that's the beginning of love. You know, obviously we want to respond to that. It's our responsibility, our response to respond and to give that love back to him and honor him and worship him like we've done this morning or this afternoon and, and uh, show that love to other people. But Jesus loves us is the foundation of everything, of, of the word of God, of our lives, of our peace and of our joy. Jesus loves us. And it's that relationship that we've been talking about in this series. Uh, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. We started that last week. And the reason why God gave, it, gave us the Ten Commandments is, if you guys were here last week, we talked about that, is that that love relationship with God, the Ten Commandments is there to enhance that relationship, for us to live in a good relationship with God. It's not a bunch of do's and do nots and, and God wants to control our lives and he wants us to be like robots walking around doing his will. No, he wants us to live in an intimate relationship with him and the commandments of God are the, are the stepping stones, if you will, in order to walk in that way. We talked last week about how all of the commands, the ten commands, are are, are, are talking about our, hor our vertical relationship with God. The first four talk about our relationship with God. I am the Lord your God. Have no other gods. Don't bow to, don't make for yourselves any graven image. All of those, the first four of them are, the, are our relationship with God. And all the other six are our relationship with others. So the, the other six would be things like honor your father and mother, do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not covet. Those things affect our relationships with others. And God understands about relationship. He wants us to have a fruitful relationship with him and a fruitful relationship with others. But there are boundaries. In any relationship, there are boundaries that, that we cannot cross and other people should not cross those boundaries. And so the Ten Commandments are, are like those boundaries. At the beginning, when God gave the Ten Commandments, he was establishing a new, a new country. They, it was a, a people that were, they didn't have a, a country yet, but they were walking through the wilderness. It was when the Israelites were going through the wilderness. And there was estimates up to probably about two million or more people that were going through the wilderness, following God, following the, the cloud by day and the fire by night, walking after God. But God said, these are, the, these are the laws for you to have a civil relationship with others and to have peace and order in this new community that they were establishing. Like we also said last week, the commands were not meant to be 
stepping stones for our salvation. God didn't say, do this and you will be saved. God did not redeem people through the law. If we look at many of the stories in history, look at Abraham. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. He had faith in God's word and that was his righteousness. We see um, even Isaac and Jacob, Abraham's descendants, even the children of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt. God redeemed them miraculously through the ten plagues and then also the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea on dry ground when God opened up the waters. That was God's redemption of Israel from Egypt. And the book of Romans and other uh, books of the Bible that Paul wrote talks about how we were slaves he uses the imagery of the Israelites in Egypt. They were slaves in Egypt, and God brought them out. He redeemed them, and he redeems us as well. It's his miraculous power in our lives. It's the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross that redeems us, that makes us into a, we are a new creation. That's, that's the language. It's not... Okay, they did this and this and this and this and this, and then God did this. No, God miraculously brought them out. And after the redemption, then we receive the law so that we can continue in that close, intimate relationship with God and that relationship with others. So the same is true in the Israelites as in the natural, so in the spiritual for our lives as well. God redeems us. He calls us out. We are no longer slaves to sin. But we are set free. We are free indeed. We are a new creation. But then God says, okay, now I want you to grow. I want you to mature. I want you to show my love to others. Jesus gave the law of love. What are the two main commandments? The greatest commandment, love God. That's this vertical relationship. And love others as you love yourself. That's the horizontal. Jesus said, Jesus went on to say there in that passage, he says, if you do this, you will, you will fulfill all of the commands. So in our introduction last week, we talked about how the law is not meant for our redemption or our salvation. Okay, that was done. That was the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But it's meant for us to grow in relationship with God. And what we're talking about in this series is principles from every single one of those Ten Commandments. And we're looking at them closely to see what did God mean for us and what can we apply in our lives to grow in the relationship that God has brought us into by his mercy and his grace. So let's look at a few verses here. God created Adam and Eve for relationship. He redeemed the children of Israel for relationship. And he redeemed us for relationship as well. Let's look at Exodus chapter 20. This is the very, very beginning of the Ten Commandments. This is Exodus chapter 20. And it's actually verse, 20, uh, verse 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So even before he gives the very first command, he's establishing the relationship again and saying, this is who I am. I am your God. I am the one who brought you out. I am the one. You remember those miracles that you just saw? I'm the one who did that. You remember the Red Sea that opened up? I'm the one who did that. I am your God. I am not the God of the Egyptians. I am the God of Israel. And he's establishing that relationship from the very, very beginning. I am your God. I did these things for you because you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood for me. This is what he was saying to the Israelites. And we can take all of those things into our own spiritual lives as well. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery, or sorry, out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then he launches into the Ten Commands. Talks about, like we said, all of the vertical relationship, all of the horizontal relationship. But it's interesting. 
at the end of the Ten Commandments, in verse 18, it says, The people trembled and stood afar off. They were still wanted to be separated from God. But look at verse 18. It says, Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood afar off. In verse 21, Moses drew near the thick darkness, and people determined that they wanted to have a distance from God. They said to Moses, you speak to God and tell us what he said. So we see the Israelites, they, wanted, they, they were afraid, and they said, oh, we don't want to get close to God. But Moses, he went up the mountain to where God was amidst, amidst all the lightning and the thunder and all that stuff. He went up to the mountain and he received the word of God on that mountain while everyone else were standing afar off. And if, it, if you, let's look at, at what Psalms 103 verse 7 says. It says, he made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. He made known his ways to Moses and his acts to the people of Israel. It's easy to know the acts of God and to see the acts of God, to read, to hear the stories about God. But Moses, in this verse, it says that Moses knew the way. Basically, he knows the why that God did something. Why did God do this? Why? He knew God's heart. He knows. He has that intimacy with God. He's the one who went up the mountain. He saw God, and they communed together. They had that relationship together. They were close together. The Israelites saw the miracles. They saw the thunders, and they saw the plagues. They saw all that great stuff. But Moses knew the why. Moses knew God, and he knew God's heart. He knew why God was doing certain things. And there's a number of people in the Bible who knew the ways of God, but there's, but there's many, many more who only experience the acts of God. Let's be people who know God intimately. You know, we talk about the the redemption of Jesus. Part of what happened when Jesus died on the cross, when he said it is finished, the temple, the, the curtain in the temple tore from the top to the bottom. And that is very symbolic of the way being made open for us. Before that time, only the chief priests go in once a year into the Holy of Holies. And they did it with fear and trembling. They actually, there's stories that they actually tied a rope around the leg of the chief priest in case he died in there. And they would have to pull him out, pull out his body if he was, you know, unclean or something and he got killed in there in the presence of God. But when Jesus died on the cross, the way was open. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. The way was open. The veil was torn. And now we, like Moses, have the ability, the, the, we're, we're welcomed into the presence of God, not just to know the acts of God, not just to read the stories, but to know, God, why did you do this? We know God's heart. We know what he was thinking. We know who our God is. And when we know him, we can be motivated with the compassion of God. We can receive the love of God, but also give the love of God to others. Because maybe we see a situation where maybe someone is walking in a way that's not honoring to God. Someone who knows the ways of God, they will reach out in compassion and love and say, Okay, let's follow God together. Let's, let's clean this up because God didn't intend for you to live this way. God intended for you to live a life of victory. God didn't intend for you to live a life of slavery to sin. And so when we know the ways of God, we can offer that to other people as well. And that's the desire that God has for us. So Moses knew the ways of God and the, the people of Israel knew his acts. So let, let's look at this first command. 
It's in verse 3 of Exodus chapter 20. I have it on the slide there. Short verse. You shall have no other gods before me. Everybody say that after me. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, in the English translation, it kind of makes it sound a little bit weird. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. So it makes us think that, okay, we can have gods after God, but not before him. Isn't that, isn't that how it sounds? You shall have no other gods before me. The after ones are okay, but just, not, just make sure they're not number one in front of God. Number two, number three, number four, that's, that's okay. It's kind of a, 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 a misleading translation. I actually like the Kamai translation a little bit better. Krawipi Knom. That's isn't that what it says in Kamai, right? So outside of me, don't have any other gods. I'm the only one. And that's actually what it originally means in the original, uh, in the original language. That word before me, it's a little bit misleading in the way that it's written because what it actually means, it, it can be translated several different ways. It can also be translated in my presence, besides me, where I am. In the, later on in uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, when they're talking about some of the sacrifices that they're given, that are given in the, uh, in the tabernacle. Later on, after they got the law, the, the Israelites made the tabernacle, and part of the rituals in the tabernacle was, what, was that they were going to uh, kill the animals and sacrifice the burnt offerings and all that sort of stuff. But several times, if you look at that, if you look at those stories, it says you are to kill the calf or the goat or whatever it is. It says... Do it before the Lord. And so it says, kill the cow before the Lord. Kill the goat before the Lord. Do these things before the Lord. Not meaning first in order, uh, in chronological order, but in the presence of God. And so they're, they're killing these calves. They're killing these goats in the presence of God, where God was. So essentially what God is saying here, don't have any other gods in my presence, where I am. God made us to be the tabernacle of God, the temple of God. God says, don't have any other gods before me. Don't have any other gods where I am. And I think that's important for us to look at and look in our own lives because if we want the presence of God, if we truly desire the presence of God, not just here on a Sunday afternoon, but each and every day of our lives, we want the presence of God. Ask yourself, are there idols? Is there anything that is there with you or with in God's presence? Is there something that you're honoring above God? Is there something that you're putting above God or even just in God's presence? God doesn't, God doesn't want to share you with anybody. He's a jealous God. He doesn't, he doesn't say, oh yeah, that's fine. You can have this other God where I am. He doesn't want to share the room with anybody. It's kind of like, you know, I think about it in marriage, in terms of marriage. What would you say, what would, my, what would your husband or your wife say if, if you said, okay, yeah, all right, uh, I'll give you the first hour of the day, but all the rest of the days I can, you know, all the rest of the hours I can do whatever I want. Your wife wouldn't, your, my, my wife my, or husband or whatever, they wouldn't have anything to do with that. They want everything, right? They want us to be faithful. The same is true with God. God wants all of us. God wants our undivided attention. You could just say, basically you could just say, you shall have no other gods. Full stop. Don't have any other gods only me. This is essentially what God is saying. I am the only one. None other. It's me. Don't have any other gods. This is what God is essentially saying in this first command. It doesn't mean that God is first and we can have some after. It means you shall have no other gods 
It means in God's presence, in, the, in front of the face of God, where God is, near me. Yeah, so the first, first point, worship God only. If you want your place or your life to be in the presence of God, don't have any other gods there. No other god or idol in the presence of God. Let's look and see what Isaiah 45 verse 5 says. Isaiah 45. Uh-oh, I didn't change that one. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's correct. That's Isaiah 45 verse 4. I forgot to change that slide. I apologize. I gave him the wrong address. I'll read Isaiah 45 verse 5. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. This is God's heart that he wants us to have towards him. I am the Lord and there is no other. No, no one compares. I'm first and I am all the other ones as well. Second, third, fourth, fifth. God wants to be everything. He doesn't want us just to say, okay, yeah, you can have my, the first hour of my day and I did my duty with you and then I can live my life the way that I want because it's mine. No, God doesn't think like that. God, God knows that he's the biggest and he knows that he's the best. And he wants us to honor him in that way as well. No other God besides me. This is God's heart and this is the heart of the first command here. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. So the first point is worship God only. Worship God only. And I think, I think I talked about this maybe last week or the week before. When we think about priorities, sometimes we think about our lives in terms of priorities. Sometimes we think about our work in terms of priorities, our to-do list in terms of priorities. What thing I need to do first, second, third. I give top priority to the most important things. And and I think that's helpful sometimes to think about our priority list, but it, it's, it's deceiving because when we do that with God, it's like we put God number one, obviously. It's just kind of a, uh, yeah, hands down, you know, it's the Sunday school answer, of course. God has to be first. But then we have all our other stuff. But God doesn't think about it like that. He thinks about it like it's a, like a pie chart. And you have your 25%, your you know, half pie, you have your 25% here, you have, you know, 25%, 50%, 33%, and it all makes up the whole of our time or of our life or whatever it is. But God doesn't want to be one piece of the pie, okay? God doesn't want to be, okay, just make sure that you give him the biggest piece and then that's it. He doesn't want to be just one slice of the pizza, okay? He wants to be the whole pizza, he wants the whole thing. And what we can do is we can still arrange our priorities in terms of 25% for this or this much for that or this much for that, this much time for that. But God doesn't want to be one slice. He wants to be the whole thing. And so, for example, if, you know, you have, I don't know, 25% for, I don't know, family, I guess, for example. He doesn't want just to be... He doesn't want us just to have the 25% there, but in that 25%, he wants to be a part of that as well. And so it's not like, it's not like there's number one, two, three, four, five, or a bigger piece or, or a smaller piece, and God's one of the pieces. He's not one of the pieces. He's not one of the pieces. He's the whole thing. And we give this time, the 25% to our family, but in that giving, of our, giving to our family, we're honoring God. We're talking about God. We're, we're, we have the mindset of Christ. We're, we have the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace. We're showing and we're, we're showing the love of God. So God is involved in the time that we have with our family. When we're at work, the exact same thing. God doesn't want to just say, okay, yeah, you did your devotions in the morning and then you can live however you want the rest of the day while you're at work. No, he wants us while we're at work 
to be honoring God and by living, to be living by his principles. Maybe we, we're remembering scripture verses that we read earlier in the morning. God wants to be a part of everything in our lives. And that's the priority. That's the way that um, God thinks about priorities. It's not just one thing, and then we get the rest of the time to ourselves, but God is the central part. God is the center of everything that we do. When I was thinking also about priorities, because this, this first command is the principle of priority. God first. God is number one. God is the only. When I was thinking about priorities, there were three things that I thought about when I was thinking about priorities. Priorities, when we think about our lives, we need to give priority to the biggest commitment in our lives. We need to give priority to the biggest commitment in our lives. So it's a priority based on commitment. Okay, you think about, for example, um, my wife and I, we got married 19 years ago. That's one of my biggest commitments in my life. So she's one of the biggest priorities in my life. Also, my kids. My kids are up there as well, okay? And they're part of the family. And, but in all reality, my wife is the number, is, is the number one, even over, even over my kids. I love my kids, and they'll always be part of my family, and I thank God for them. But eventually, they're going to go, and they're going to have their own families in that as well. Um, and so then they're going to give their commitment to another person and to another family, and they're going to live their lives uh, following God's, God's calling for their lives. But for me, myself, my priority belongs to the, to the place where I made the largest commitment. And in my life, even bigger than my wife is my commitment to the Lord. It's our commitment to the Lord because when we think about the length of this commitment, it's a commitment to the Lord that's going to last for all eternity. And it's his commitment to us. Jesus, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Wow. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And the Bible says that when we get to heaven, you know, there's going to be no, no people who are you know, husband and wife and all that, but we're going to have communion with the Lord. That commitment that we've made, you know, whether it be yesterday or many, many years ago, that commitment will continue on into eternity. And so the priority is based on the level of commitment. Okay? And now you can think about other things that are, you know, that would be less of a commitment. Okay? You know, you buy a you know, your groceries, okay? So, yeah, the groceries are important, but you're going to eat them, and they're going to be gone in, you know, a couple of days. So are you giving greater priority to the food or to your family? You know, just, just the way, it's just a, a way of thinking about things is what are the things that you have committed to that are important? And that's, what, that's the way that we should be thinking about our priorities. Number two, it's also based on duration, uh, it's kind of, those two kind of go hand in hand together. It's a relationship that's going to be lasting forever. That prior, that relationship that you've begun with the Lord is going to last for all of eternity. That's a long time. But that's the number one priority that we should have. Number three, priority based on value. I thought about this a few years ago, and it's been something that's really touched my heart is to give value to the one who values, values you the most. God loves you more than anybody. More than anything. We started the service by saying, Jesus loves me. And it's true. And it's three little words. But it's three words that are full of truth and life and transformative power. But it's God's value for us. God's value for us is that even if we were the only one, he said, I'm going to die for you. 
I want to redeem you. I want to set you free from the bondage of sin and slavery. I want to wash you white as snow. I want to give you righteousness. I want to fill you with hope and life and peace. This is what God does for us. Why? Because we are important to him. We are valuable to him. He values us more than anybody. So we should value him. We should put him as the highest value, the highest priority in our lives. Sometimes we, say, we might say, oh, yeah, I'm tired on Sunday. I need to rest. Okay, yeah, rest is good and everything, but don't miss church. Don't miss being in the presence of God, the one who values you. You have an opportunity to meet with the creator of the world, the one who loves you more than anybody else in the world. Don't miss that chance. Don't miss that opportunity. Don't put other relationships above God because they don't value you as much as God values you. In fact, they might not even like you. And you're thinking, oh, if I get in good with them, things are going to be better. No. Get close to God. He's the one who values you. He's the one who loves you more than anybody, more than anything. Give value to the one who values you the most. Think about it. Sometimes people don't value you. But you're longing for their approval. You're longing to have a close relationship with them. Let's stop all that. Get close to the one who values us the most. Second point, put God first. Put God first. When Joshua led the children of Israel into the promised land, God said, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight to take that land. It's a good land. He said it's a land flowing with milk and honey. They had a huge bunch of grapes that two people had to carry between themselves. Massively fruitful, but God said, you're going to have to fight for it. But I'm going to deliver the people of Canaan into your hand. The giants, the enemies, just follow me. Just follow me and you will see victory in the land of Canaan. And so they went to Jericho, and God said, march around. March around once a day. Go march around. And they did it two, three, four, five, six days in a row. And on the seventh day, they went around seven times, and they shouted, blew the trumpet, so the walls fell. God said, don't take any of the plunder. Don't take any of the gold. Don't take any of the silver. Don't take any of the nice things that you see in there. It's all for me. It's all for me. This is what God said. The first, the first city that they took, it was all dedicated unto the Lord. Okay? Now we know what happened. Achan sinned. He saw gold and silver. He took it. And he took a nice robe and buried it in his tent. And they went to the next battle. And the army was smaller. The city was smaller. But they lost. And they found out that it was because of Achan and his family that had taken what belonged to God. So we see in this story, we see the principle of giving God what is first. <clears throat> we also see that the firstborn, the firstborn was always dedicated to the Lord. And uh, it, it was not just the flocks, but it was also the, uh, the, the firstborn sons were also dedicated to the Lord, and then they were redeemed, bought back. And so the, the mom and the dad, they had to bring a sacrifice. We see that when, when Mary and Joseph went to the temple. They brought, you know, two pigeons or two turtle doves, and they brought that as their sacrifice to, because Jesus was their firstborn son. And so everything was the first, the first, the first, the first. It even says in, when we give the tithe, the first 10%, we give it to God. Why is that? Number one, it's because God wants us to understand that everything that we get comes from him. Everything that we get. Even, you take a seed, you plant it in the ground, you say, I did that. 
you know, and it starts to grow and bring a tree. You can't say, I did that. The, tr the seed didn't come from you. You didn't make the dirt to make it grow. It's all God. Everything that we get comes from God. God gives you the strength to work. God gives you the wisdom, the new ideas, the creative ideas to work and to, to, to see new ideas come. And, and so everything that we get is from God. And so the, giving God the 10% is saying, God, yep, it all comes from you. It's also a way that we can say to God, God, I recognize you, but I also trust you as well. I trust you as well. The God will do more with our 90% than we could do with 100%. And so when we give the tithe, we're saying, God, I trust you that you're going to bless this money. And it's not just asking God to do it, but he's promised to do that in the book of Malachi. So when we give God the first, it's saying to God, God, I recognize you and I honor you with, with this sacrifice that I'm giving. We also see in Genesis chapter 4, it's the story of Cain and Abel. And as a kid, you wonder, like, this is kind of a weird story. You know, God accepted one sacrifice, didn't accept the other, and then Cain gets mad, kills his brother. But listen to what it says there. It says, talking about the sacrifice, they both brought sacrifices. Cain brought, you know, he was a farmer and he brought fruit of the ground. Abel was a shepherd. But listen to the, listen to the, the, the time words in this. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 to 5. In the course of time, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Okay, so I don't know how much longer afterwards, but it says in the course of time. It wasn't the first fruits for Cain. Okay, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Abel offered the first fruits of his flocks, but Cain didn't. And this was about 2,500 years before the Ten Commandments. God honors when we honor him with the first of what we have. God honors us when we honor him with our first. Matthew 6, verse 33, what does it say? Seek ye first... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Seek ye first. I've never done it, but I think it would be a very interesting Bible study to look at all the times in the Bible when God says first, first, first. Do this first. Do this first. And I, 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 I'm, I could guarantee you that it will shape the way you value things and the priorities that you put on life. And seek ye first the kingdom of God. One more story in the Bible in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17 is a story of Elijah and the widow. The interesting thing about this story is that it came after Elijah's prophetic word. He said, his prophetic word was, it's not going to rain again until I say Wow, that's a pretty brave prophetic word. And it, it didn't. It didn't rain until Elijah said. But right away, there was hardships that came because of his prophetic word. For himself personally, he had to get the ravens to come and feed him and drink at the brook, and then the, the brook dried up. But his prophetic word also had negative consequences on this widow as well. She ran out of all her food, and she said, I'm going to make this last little meal, and then me and my son, we're going to die. Just a little loaf of bread or whatever it was. And God brought Elijah, found the widow. She was collecting sticks. And, they made, and, and Elijah said, what are you doing? She said, oh, I'm going to make this last loaf of bread for me and my son, and then we're going to die. A really uh, grim outlook. But Elijah said, 
no, I want you to do this first. Before you do this, first make a small cake for me. And so she did it out of faith and made a small cake for Elijah. And God did a miracle for Elijah through the widow. And God did a miracle for the widow through Elijah. And as a result of that, she never lacked after that. Her, her, flour didn't dry, her flour didn't run out, and her oil didn't run out either. And so she, was, she had constant provision after that because she put God and the man of God first. What would she say? If, what, would ha- what, a, what would have happened to her if she said, no, I'm just going to do this. This is the last. I love my son. and I care for him. I need to provide for him. This is going to be the last. God can turn the last into the first. When we turn our last into the first, it's the first of many, many more. And that's what God wants to do in our lives. When we put him first, sometimes it might seem like the last. But God says, no, you give me the first, and it's going to be the first and the the beginning of many, many more. God wants us to put him as the first priority in our lives. The central part. He doesn't share the room with anybody. He doesn't want to share you with anybody. He wants all of your heart, every part of your heart. Honor him by giving him the first. Say, God, all of this comes from you. I'm just giving you this first because it all comes from you anyway. And God will just pour out blessing after blessing after blessing. But more than that, God will shape your heart to be focused and directed on him at all times. Amen? This is the principle of priority. The principle of priority from the first command in the Bible. You shall have no other gods before me. Worship me only. That's what God wants from our lives. Amen? Amen. So let's live on that principle. Let's all stand up together. And let's pray. I don't want to just be the only one praying here. I would like you guys, we all have an opportunity to talk to the creator of the universe right now. Maybe you've never prayed before. Maybe you don't pray often. But God is here waiting to hear your prayer. Why don't you say a quick prayer to the Lord, saying, God, I want to prioritize you in my life. I want to make you more of a priority, more of a focus. Speak these words to him. Let him hear your voice. Let him hear your prayer. Because God is a God who's alive and real and answers prayer. And he's going to speak to you in your heart in that still small voice today. Just take a minute or two and just pray to the Lord. God, we thank you for your intense love for us. God, we thank you that you are real and alive and near us, God. Lord, we want to live according to this principle of priority, God. God, you don't want to share the room with anybody, any other gods. So God, we say, Come, come. God, you don't want to share the room with fear. 
You don't want to share the room with worry. You don't want to share the room with sin and discouragement. God, you don't want to share the room with a defeated attitude. But God, you made the way because of your greatness, because of your miraculous power, and because of your love, oh God. Lord, and we say, have your way in our lives, God. Sit on the throne of our hearts that there would be no other gods besides you. None other, God. We give you the only place in our lives. We give you the only throne of our hearts. We give it to you, God. We thank you for your love. We thank you for redeeming us, that we can walk into that level of freedom, into that relationship with you, God. We love you. We are committed to you. We thank you for this relationship that we have with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you guys all for coming this afternoon. If there's anybody who has any prayer requests, maybe it's regarding the message this afternoon or personal things, uh, prayers for healing in your soul or healing in your body, we'd love to pray together with you guys. We always have our leaders up front here waiting, and we would love to meet together with prayer for you guys. So if you have any prayer needs, come on up to the front. If you don't, God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you guys all next week. Thank you very much.